How's this for a career? A gentleman ranker who fought in the Zulu War, later chased Boer commandos across South Africa, commanded the South African Brigade on the Somme, and, as if that wasn't enough, the old war horse went on to take charge of an elite division on the Western Front. Stay tuned to the end to learn all about that story. So who was he? It was this gentleman, Henry Timson Tim Lukin, born in Fulham, London, 1860, the son of a London barrister. He left school in 1875, desperate to go to Sandhurst and become an army officer. But the entrance exams were too difficult for him, and so he joined up as a ranker in 1878. By January 1879, he was a lance corporal, a gentleman ranker in the 53rd Shropshire Foot. But the war in South Africa was now beginning, and this young fire-eater was desperate to be in on the action. He sailed at his own expense from Southampton aboard the Nyanza to South Africa in January 1879. Here he had a cousin, Captain Jack Spurgin, who was serving in Zululand as the adjutant of the 3rd 60th foot. He helped arrange for Lukin to be commissioned a lieutenant in the Natal Native Pioneers in February. Lukin wasn't even 19 yet. After some time spent extending the wagon trails, he transferred to Major Bengoff's 2nd Battalion of the Natal Native Contingent. This unit, made up of black levies, was part of the second invasion of Zululand and was attached to the 2nd Division under General Newdigate. They took part in the final pitched battle of the Zulu War, the Battle of Alundi on the 4th of July 1879. It was a crushing Zulu defeat, but as the warriors fell back, Lord Chelmsford, the British commander, unleashed his mounted troops, including Lukin's regiment. Suddenly, as the men charged though, Lukin reeled in the saddle and Bengoff called out, Lukin, you're hit! He said he was fine, but then collapsed unconscious. He had received a serious gunshot wound to the leg. Having regained consciousness, he remounted his horse and rode back to the ambulance inside the British Square. After the battle, he returned to England to recuperate, having in five months earned a commission, fought in a decisive battle and been badly wounded. He was now entitled to the South African War Medal with the Clasp 1879. By the way, I just want to interrupt for a second to thank my good mate Cameron V. Simpson who researched and co-wrote this episode. If you haven't read any of his books, then do look him up, they're now on Amazon. Also, if you enjoy stories of the Zulu War, then you can sign up for my mailing list over at redcoathistory.com newsletter. When you do so, you'll receive a free ebook all about the Battle of Isandwana. Anyway, let's get back to our story. Immediately following the Zulu War, the Cape Mounted Rifles, the only permanent standing force in the Cape, was expanding, and Liu King, now recovered from his wounds and still pursuing a military career, secured a commission on the recommendation of Major Bengoff. Two other Zulu War veterans, Cecil Darcy VC and Charles Shervington, were also commissioned into the CMR, so that gives you an idea of how highly Liu King was thought of. Darcy VC was in fact Lukin's first troop commander and we've got a video coming out about him in the near future so stay tuned and make sure to subscribe. As a lieutenant in the left wing CMR, he joined them at Pakwane Ridge in Basutuland in March 1881 during the gun war. This was a tough campaign in the mountains of modern day Lesotho. But Lukin arrived just as the fighting was winding down and he only took part in patrolling no serious action. The regiment now faced a long spell of peace, and despite lots of experience and attending many training courses, promotion for Lukin in the CMR was slow going. It wasn't until February in 1894 he was promoted to captain and appointed as the gunnery instructor of the CMR artillery troop at Umtata in South Africa's Eastern Cape. Major A. E. Lorch wrote of Lukin in his book The Story of the Cape Mounted Rifles, at that time, the officers of the regiment were inclined to an opinion that nothing less than a commission in the regular Imperial Army of Great Britain was comparable than one in the Cape Mounted Riflemen. Young Luking had that grit and efficiency which won him promotion to captain, and after he organised the artillery troop into a smart horse artillery battery, and then produced an establishment of signallers which during the South African War became widely known throughout the British Army. Shortly after, Lukin served with the Pondoland Field Force in 1894 and then the Bechuanaland Rebellion not long afterwards where he was the field adjutant to Lieutenant Colonel Dalgety, the OC. During that campaign on the 14th of April 1897, he took part in the attack at Totostat and was mentioned in dispatches twice. But trouble was brewing and in 1899 the Second Anglo-Boer War broke out. This was where Lukin really began to prove himself and his military skill and leadership came to the fore. 
He was now 39 years old and took to the field with his guns under the command of Major Sprenger, the hero of Morosi's Mountain, a campaign covered previously on this channel. Check that out. With the formation of the Colonial Division in February 1900, he commanded all the divisional artillery and they were continuously in action. During the fight at Labouchain's Neck in March 1900, Lukin's guns were a deciding factor, having been manhandled onto the high ground at night. When Christian de Vett, one of the great Boer leaders, besieged part of the Colonial Division near Vepina, Lukin commanded the artillery with great skill. In fact, Lieutenant Colonel Dalgetty on the 29th of April 1900 submitted his recommendations for awards to Lord Roberts and said, Captain Lukin commanded the artillery and did most excellent work, putting one of the enemy's guns out of action. For that, he was awarded a DSO. Shortly afterwards, he was promoted to local lieutenant colonel and commander of the CMR attached to the Imperial forces. With the Boer capitals under British control, the days of set-piece battles were over. The Boers now continued a guerrilla-style war, and the British were forced to heavily rely on their colonial soldiers to counter the Boer commandos. It was this anti-guerrilla fighting that Lukin and his men now focused on. In the Cape Colony, they faced Commandant G. Sheepers and General P. H. Kritzinger. These were difficult operations against a skilled and worthy opponent. In June 1901, Lukin became the second in command of Colonel Harry Scoble's column, serving alongside Colonel Haig, the CO of the 17th Lancers. I'm sure that name may ring a bell because, yep, it's the same Haig who later commanded the BEF in World War I. Lukin's star was now rising, and in June 1901, he was awarded a CMG for a night attack at Wildefontaine Farm in the Lady Grey district. In October of the same year, he was appointed by Lord Kitchener to command a flying column. This one was fast and competent. In fact, Boer Commandant Ben Bauer later wrote of Lukin's column, One would have thought that the colonial troops would have been better able to cope with us, and this was in fact the case, especially as far as the Cape Mounted Rifles were concerned. When we had dealings with them, they were under the command of Tim Lukin. Whenever Lukin was after us, we knew it without having to be told. The Cape Mounted Rifles were composed of picked men, good shots and riders, and they had plenty of luck. When your enemy speaks highly of you like that, you know you're doing a good job. And in December 1901, Lukin was appointed commander of Number 1 Division, Cape Colonial Forces, with the local rank of Colonel. He held the position until December 1902, six months after the war finished. It had been a hell of a war for this man. He had proved himself as a complete stud. He began the war as a captain and was now a colonel with a CMG and a DSO. Not bad going. In the post-war years, he commanded the CMR and in 1904 was appointed as a full colonel and commandant general of the Cape Colonial Forces. He attended the King George V coronation in London and military manoeuvres in Switzerland. But he was now in his early 50s and retirement was on the cards. But the world had other ideas, and in 1914, the Great War began. Lukin was given command of A Force, over 2,000 men tasked with helping to conquer German Southwest Africa, now known as Namibia. But on the 24th of September 1914, at Sandfontein, just across the South African border, there was a major setback when part of his brigade was surrounded and forced to surrender. But Despite this serious setback, Lukin and the other column commanders used their Boer War experience to eventually overcome the Germans who finally surrendered in July 1915. Shortly afterwards, Lukin was promoted to Brigadier General and given command of the newly raised 1st Infantry Brigade for service on the Western Front. On the way to France, the brigade stopped off in Egypt just long enough to help mount a campaign against the Senussis. They were a religious order of Arabic nomads who had recently revolted in the desert in support of the Turks. Yet again, Lukin distinguished himself and was awarded a CB for his successful command of the South African Brigade during the battles of Halazin on the 23rd of January and Agagia on the 26th of February 1916. Finally, after this short detour to Egypt, the South African Brigade finally arrived on the Western Front in April 1916 and joined the 9th Scottish Division under Major General William Furs. Little did they know the intense fighting that was in store for them on the Somme. Lukin led them into the line at Bernafay Wood on the 11th of July 1916, 10 days after the British offensive had been launched. They were under heavy artillery fire for two days and then on the 14th of July, they were ordered to capture Delville Wood. 
It was a desperate and horrific fight, a shocking introduction to modern European warfare. The brigade did achieve their objective, capturing the wood, but at a terrible cost. For example, to give you a sense of how bad it was, let's look at the casualties. They'd begun the battle with 131 officers and 3,032 men, and by the time they were relieved, they numbered just five officers and 750 men who were still in the line and unwounded. It says a lot that the Germans threw nine and a half battalions against Lukin's brigade and couldn't defeat them. That tells you how tough these South African warriors were. But despite their losses, the Scottish division was soon back in action, tasked with capturing the formidable Butt de Vallen Court. They scrapped hard but failed in their attempts between the 12th and the 24th of October 1916. This led to General Furs being relieved of the divisional command of the 9th Division and, yep, you guessed it, Lukin with the rank of Major General was appointed as his replacement. We shouldn't underestimate what an amazing achievement this was, for a man who would have been considered a colonial to be given command of a British division, especially an elite one like the 9th, was a tremendous testimony to the high regard he was now held in by the High Command, especially his old colleague from the Boer War, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig. Lukin commanded the division during the Battle of Arras in April 1917, and again at Ypres in September-October of the same year, where they lost over 2,000 men. But what sort of commander was he? Well, he was known to work closely with his staff and regimental officers and maintained an intense training regime when out of the line. One battalion commander recalled Lucan at Ypres. He said, In the early stage of the night march, we met the divisional commander, who, like all the divisional commanders of the 9th Division, spent most of his time near the front lines. He was on his way back and this good old regimental officer insisted on getting off the track and up to his knees in mud while the men went by. As they did, he said, I have a comfortable dugout to go back to when we offered to make way for him. That's a proper officer right there, isn't it? Anyway, in 1918, he came to the UK and was knighted by the King at Buckingham Palace. He was now Sir Tim Lukin. But his time in command of the 9th Division was over. The 9th Division history recorded that, at the beginning of March, General Lukin was appointed to a command in England. During his period of command, the 9th had gained numerous outstanding successes, particularly of the 9th of April and 20th of September 1917, and developed a steady reputation so firmly established at Luz. He had served with the division for nearly two years and had won the esteem and confidence of all ranks. Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig on the 20th of March 1918 wrote a letter to the South African High Commission in London commending Lukin and stating that he was one of the most reliable divisional commanders in France. He was now given command of the 64th, bracket 2nd Highland Division, and after the war returned to Cape Town aboard the Balmoral Castle in March 1920. It had been an exceptional career, and he finally retired and threw himself into the welfare of South African veterans. In 1924, as the first president of the British Empire Service League in South Africa, he hosted Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig. But inevitably, after such a tough career, Aged 65, he finally died at Muizenberg in December 1925. It had been a long and painful illness. His statue still stands proudly in Cape Town. Major General Sir Henry Timson Lukin, KCB, CMG, DSO, I salute you, sir. A true warrior and a man who both British and South Africans should be proud of. <laughs>